This is the all-new Surface Pro 9, and it looks very much like all of the previous models, but uh, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. It's a great form factor. I love the integral kickstand and the magnetic keyboard cover. But what's interesting with this particular generation is that now you can get it with a 12th gen Intel Core i7, and that's the model that we've got here. Uh, specifically, it has the Core i7-1255U chip, and that means that potentially it offers the same performance as the M1 or M2 chips from Apple. So the question is, has Microsoft finally built an iPad Pro killer? Whichever tablet you choose to buy, whether it's a, a Surface Pro, an iPad, or something like Samsung's brilliant S8, uh, what you'll find is there are always compromises. Each platform has pros and cons, both in hardware and software. Now, I use all of these devices and I, I like them all, but I find there are frustrations with them too. But I'm particularly interested to see how the Surface Pro compares to the iPad Pro when it comes to performance. So let's get straight into it and break out some Geekbench 5. My iPad Pro here is the 16 gigabyte M1 model, and it scores uh, 1,722 on single core, 7,308 on multi-core. The M2 chip in the latest iPad Pro offers even more performance thanks to its higher clock speed, so you can expect single core scores around 1,872, and multi-core scores at 8,411. That's really impressive raw CPU performance on offer. Only three years ago, these were the sort of performance figures top-end laptops could only dream about. So the question is, how does the i7 chip in the Surface Pro compare? I tested this one at 1,726 on single core. Uh, Multi-core was 8,630, and that puts it right on par with the M2 iPad Pro for multi-threaded tasks. So the Surface Pro 9 with the i7-1255U offers the same performance as the M1 and M2 iPads, right? Well, before you get too carried away, just remember that this is a synthetic benchmark. It's not fully representative of real-world use. Benchmarks are great for comparing similar chips, like the M1 and the M2, to each other, but they can sometimes be misleading when comparing different architectures, which is what we're doing here. In the real world, the i7 will manage some tasks better, and the M chips will be better in other tasks. And there are also the compromises that we mentioned earlier. In the case of the iPad, a big compromise here is iPadOS, which makes it very difficult to actually tap into the full performance of the M1, let alone the M2. And tablet form factors are thermally compromised. Even if you could make use of maximum performance, it will quickly throttle back as the device heats up. The Surface Pro actually has a fan inside to help with this, but in a chassis this thin, you need to be realistic with your expectations. Uh, these figures really represent what the machine is capable of at peak performance for very brief periods. And there's a fairly big compromise with the Surface Pro, because out of the box it will be in Windows recommended power mode, which turns down performance in favour of long battery life. Let's just run that Geekbench 5 test again as the Surface Pro is shipped out of the box. And we're down to just 860 on single core, and that multi-core performance drops to 4429. In other words, we are having performance in order to get that all-day battery life. Uh, let's be clear here, the multi-core score we're getting here is showing there's still plenty of performance in low power mode for pretty much every task that you might typically use a device like this for. But that single core score, that is noticeable uh, even in just general use, and particularly when you're browsing busy websites. So we're back to compromises. Uh, now in fairness, if you work the iPad Pro really hard, the battery is going to drain faster too. I think the difference is that the iPad is very good at automatically ramping its power consumption to match what you're doing. Uh, Windows machines do do the same thing, but you also have this setting within Windows to restrict that. Now I've only had a week or so to use the Surface Pro, so I haven't fully tested battery life, but anecdotally I'd say that it seems pretty similar to the iPad Pro. And I used this device for a couple of days of business planning last week, and it ran all day without any troubles. Now, obviously we need to do a bit more testing on that, and your mileage may vary. And I also haven't done any in-depth testing with GPU performance either. Though I think it's safe to say that the iPad has got the Surface Pro comfortably beaten here. Now that's not to say that graphics performance on the Surface Pro is bad. There's plenty of performance here for productivity tasks, and probably enough for some light gaming too. In Geekbench 5, it scores 17,687 for OpenCL, and 16,724 for Vulkan. 
but we can't use this test as a direct comparison for the iPad because the M chips aren't optimized for OpenCL and they don't support Vulkan. Uh, nonetheless, the M1 iPad Pro scores 21,128 using Metal. Now, it's not the most reliable test, um, but I would be confident in saying that the iPad here has got a little more graphics performance under the hood than the Surface Pro. But of course, there is another important caveat when it comes to performance with this lineup of Surface Pro 9. The i7 isn't the only chip available. You've also got the option of the 12th gen Core i5, that's the 1235U processor, and then there's a separate ARM model with Microsoft's SQ3 processor. Uh, that particular chip definitely doesn't compete with Apple's M chips, and ARM Windows still needs a bit of work, but I think it's really nice to see the progress there. The SQ3 model also has a neural processing unit which provides some machine learning abilities that the Intel Surface Pros don't get. Uh, for example, automatic reframing of the webcam, like center stage on the iPad. And it gets a 5G modem. Uh, I haven't personally tested that model, so I can't say much more about it. So let's get back to the Intel models. As standard with these, you get eight gigabytes of RAM, but you can optionally choose 16 gigabytes, like the model I've got here, or you can even go up to 32 gigabytes. Storage starts at 256 gigs, and there's options for 512 and one terabyte. I went for the 256 gigabyte model because on the Surface Pro 9, you can actually upgrade the SSD later if you want. Underneath the kickstand on the back of the device here, we've got this uh, magnetic cover, if I can pop that off. And you can see there's a little 2230 SSD in there. Uh, so you can upgrade it. So changing the hardware would probably be a simple plug and play operation, but of course you'll also need to clone and transfer the operating system to the new SSD. Uh, definitely doable, but probably not for beginners. Still, it is nice to have an upgrade and replacement path for a component like an SSD with a limited lifespan, even if the lifespan is probably way longer than the useful life of the device. And of course, there's no possibility to change the iPad SSD. And Apple also ties RAM to SSD size. So if you spec a terabyte or higher in your iPad, you get 16 gigs of RAM. Otherwise, it's eight gigs. We did a speed test of the internal drives using Jazz Disk Bench, which is a cross-platform benchmark, so it runs on Windows and on iPadOS. Here are the sequential read and write figures. However, it should be said that the one terabyte SSD in the iPad Pro has two NAND flash chips, so it can use both channels to improve reading performance. You might find that the smaller SSDs in the iPad range uh, aren't quite as fast. The drive that's in the Surface Pro is made by Samsung, and it appears to be PCI Express 4.0. Anyway, let's uh, talk about I.O. Uh, like the previous model, the Surface Pro 9 has got two Type-C ports, but they've been moved onto the other side of the device. The proprietary charging port is still on the same side, but it's been moved up. Uh, when it comes to charging, though, you don't have to use Microsoft's charger. You can just charge via either of these Type-C ports. But the big news with these particular ports is that on the Intel models, they are Thunderbolt 4 ports. And that opens up all sorts of possibilities with peripherals and the ability to drive multiple external displays. The iPad Pro, on the other hand, has a single USB 4 port, which incorporates Thunderbolt 3. It can drive one external display. And when I've tested it previously, I found it to be a bit lacking in performance. So let's do a quick test with Jazz Dispench and a couple of external drives. I've got here a Samsung T7, which is USB 3.2 generation two. I've got a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure with a Western Digital Black SN750 drive in it. Uh, there are faster drives available, of course, but what I'm really interested in here is comparing the port speeds of the two devices. And let's start with the T7 on the Surface Pro. We get sequential reads of 966 megabytes per second and writes at 734. And that's about as much performance as I'd expect to see from one of these drives. The iPad, though, doesn't fare so well with reads at 761 and writes at only 222. Uh, we've seen this before, of course. The implementation of USB 4 on the standard M1 and M2 chips is just not as good as it is on the M1 Pro and Macs or the Intel machines. And it gets even worse in the iPad. Now, that may be in part due to the controller they're using, but it's also probably being limited by iPad OS. Uh, like I said earlier, there's always compromises. For completeness, let's put up the figures for a random 4K test. Now, this is where we test transferring lots of four kilobyte files. Uh, lots of small files massively increases the overhead on transfers and slows everything down. If you can imagine a sequential test as a best case scenario, this is a worst case scenario. 
and the Surface Pro is again comfortably ahead, especially on write times. I'm not at all surprised by these results. The Surface Pro is performing absolutely as expected, and the iPad is slower because its USB and file handling implementations are just not where they need to be. And we've reported on that plenty of times before on the channel, so let's move on. And we'll take a look now at Thunderbolt performance. So we'll start with a sequential test again, and with this particular drive we get 1,566 megabytes per second read performance, and write speed on the Surface Pro at 1,397. And that's about what I'd expect for this combination. And before the comments section lights up, yes, Thunderbolt drives can be much faster than this. We've only got a basic consumer SSD in this enclosure. But remember, we're not interested in the drive speed so much as the Thunderbolt port performance and how it compares between the two devices. I know that M1 Max can achieve these same kind of speeds with this drive, but what about the iPad Pro? It scores 1,484 on read and 1,007 on write. And we've seen this before too, the Thunderbolt implementation in the iPad doesn't appear to be quite up to the same standard as it is on Intel machines. You could conclude from this that the iPad Pro is severely deficient when it comes to using external drives, but that's not quite the full picture. When we look at the 4K test for this drive, you'll find that the iPad actually performs better than the Surface Pro. So we decided also to do a real-world file transfer copy from each of the drives, and then we timed it. We used a folder of files totaling about 24 and a half gigabytes, and here are the results from each drive and each tablet. In this real-world test, the iPad Pro actually outperforms the Surface Pro with the Thunderbolt drive, though it is a, a long way back on writing to the USB drive. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, in the battle of ports, the Surface Pro is the winner. It's got two Thunderbolt 4 ports, and you could potentially use both of those whilst charging the device with the proprietary connector. Uh, the iPad has just one USB 4 slash Thunderbolt 3 port, which doesn't really quite perform as it should. So let's move on then and talk about screens. The 13-inch display in the Surface Pro is 2880 pixels by 1920, and that gives you a density of 267 pixels per inch, almost identical to the iPad screen. It's got a dynamic refresh rate as well up to 120 hertz, and a contrast rate of 1200 to 1. It's your standard good quality backlit LCD display. Microsoft don't publish a brightness figure on their website, but it does seem to be plenty bright enough. I've got no complaints here. The thing is, it's just not as good as the mini LED display in the iPad Pro 12.9 inch. Uh, because it's mini LED, that means additional brightness if you're viewing HDR content. And this display also has support for the P3 color gamut. So that's 10 bit color and 26% more color space than sRGB like you get on the Surface Pro. Now I think with a tablet form factor, the quality of the screen is of paramount importance. Perhaps it's even more important to the end user than all of the performance aspects that we've been discussing. And for the price, Microsoft really needed to put a better display in the Surface Pro 9. Now that's not to say that this is a bad display, it really isn't. But those differences will certainly matter to some people. So let's talk about pricing because it's actually difficult to compare these models like for like because of the way Apple bundles memory with SSD size. But in the UK, the Surface Pro starts at £1,099. That gets you the i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. I'll pop up the US prices on screen because they're probably quite different at the moment. Uh, the iPad Pro 12.9 inch here in the UK starts at £1,249, which gets you an M2, 8 gigs of RAM and a 128 gig SSD. If you spec the 256 gig SSD, that pushes the price up to £1,369, so quite a bit more than the Surface Pro, but it's probably not a fair comparison with the i5 model. So let's instead look at the model I have here with the i7, 16 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. That costs £1,599. So it's more expensive than the iPad Pro, but it does have double the amount of RAM. So the only way we'll be able to get a true comparison is to go up to the one terabyte spec. Let's spec a Surface Pro 9 with the i7, 16 gigs of RAM and a terabyte SSD, which comes to a whopping £2,199. Now do the same with the iPad Pro and we'll also get 16 gigs of RAM and that comes to £2,049. So the Surface Pro is more expensive in this configuration and that's even with the massive price hikes we've had in the UK recently on iPads. But just bear in mind that you can upgrade the SSD yourself on the Surface Pro. So it's probably fair to say that they're fairly evenly matched on pricing here in the UK. 
Of course, these sorts of devices benefit from having these keyboards and also these stylus devices. So let's take a look at those and see how that changes the picture. Now here on the Surface Pro, I've got the signature keyboard. It's a nice backlit full keyboard with a glass trackpad, and it's got a built-in storage tray for the Slim Pen 2. And the keyboard has a pretty decent feel to it, and it's pretty good to type on. And I like the way that you can achieve a variety of different postures by using the kickstand. It is true that the iPad on the Magic Keyboard takes up a smaller footprint on a desk, but it does have much less adjustability compared to the Surface Pro. And I also find that the balance is slightly off with the heavier M1 and M2 iPad Pros, so there's actually less usable screen angles when you're using it on your lap. I would give the Magic Keyboard the edge though in typing feel, but I'm gonna call it a draw because you don't get any function keys on the Magic Keyboard, and of course we get a full complement of function keys with the Surface Pro. It would probably come as no surprise to you that the trackpad is in no contest win for the Magic Keyboard. Uh, PC trackpads have come a long way, but you just can't beat that smooth scrolling that Apple achieves with their trackpads, thanks to the tight optimization of software and hardware. The Surface Pro trackpad also has a dive board style action to it. So whereas you can click anywhere on the iPad trackpad, on the Surface Pro keyboard, you can only click at the front here. Now that might not bother you if like me, you use uh, tap to click and two finger taps for right click, but there are still times where you need to click and I find this limitation a little bit frustrating. When it comes to the uh, pens, I've always believed that the Apple Pencil offers the best drawing experience in a tablet. And the Microsoft Slim Pen 2 hasn't changed my view on that. Uh, when it comes to writing though, I'd say that the best pen is the Samsung S Pen actually. Um, so the Microsoft Slim Pen is kind of like a nice middle ground between those two, a good all rounder. Oh, and uh, if you have an older Surface Pen model, you'll be pleased to know that it works just fine with the Surface Pro 9 and can still be magnetically attached to the side. Uh, with the iPad, I find that the pencil, which docks on the top magnetically, often falls off uh, when you're putting it in your bag, things like that. It's easy to lose your pencil. It's not as secure as what we've got here with the Surface Pro, uh, where the slim pen docks neatly into the keyboard and charges there as well. Uh, just remember though, you only get that pen tray on the more expensive signature keyboard. Now, speaking of pricing, this signature keyboard with the pen adds another £260 to the price. Uh, with the iPad, you'll pay £139 for the pencil and £379 for the keyboard. So that's an eye-watering additional £518. Ouch. Now, for completeness, let's also quickly talk about webcam and speakers. I much prefer the webcam placement on the Surface Pro because it's more usual to use a device of this size in landscape orientation. So you want the webcam to be in the center of the long edge on the top. Uh, the iPad Pro camera is on the short edge, so it always looks like you're looking off to the side when you're using it. And when it comes to actual quality, we think that the Surface Pro is better in most circumstances. There seems to be more detail and less noise. However, the iPad Pro is better at sorting out some lighting situations. Overall though, I prefer the Surface Pro 9's web camera. And we've just recorded here a quick microphone comparison and I'll let you decide which you think is best. This is the webcam and microphone on the Surface Pro 9. This is the webcam and the microphone on the iPad Pro. When it comes to the speakers, we turned them up to the max and we popped on some Crab Rave on YouTube. Uh, the iPad Pro speakers are definitely louder than the Surface Pro. Now, when it comes to actual quality of sound though, I don't think there's much in it. Now, given how good Apple are at getting speakers to sound way better than they have any right to in devices like this, well, we just have to say well done to Microsoft. So, has Microsoft made an iPad Pro killer? Killer is a strong word, but I think they've certainly narrowed the gap between these devices, especially when it comes to hardware performance. Although the iPad does still have more raw performance on offer, and it's very difficult to argue against the superior display. But the rest though is largely going to come down to personal preference. And that would be all if hardware were the only variable here. But of course the software experience offered by these devices is completely different. And software is surely half the equation here. Now you might have a preference for one or the other, and that's fine, we all have preferences. But those things are subjective. So looking at this objectively, 
The iPad is limited by its OS, whereas the Surface Pro is running the full version of Windows. So when it comes to using a Pro tablet like this as a computer, with the keyboards and the trackpads, then I'd say the Surface Pro is probably the winner because it is a full PC. But if you're using the device in the tablet form factor, the decision is not so simple. iPadOS is a better tablet experience than Windows, which doesn't even have a specific tablet or touch UI anymore. Uh, when you take the keyboard off, it just spaces things out a little more to make touching the screen easier. And we could probably make a whole video just about the differences in software, but I don't think we need to in order to come to a conclusion because you probably already know which software experience would work best for you on a device like this. And like everything, there are pros, there are cons and compromises. For me, I love the iPad Pro, but I also love the Surface Pro. Now, if I could keep both, that would be ideal, but actually I do need to pick one of these. And if I had to make that choice right now, I'm gonna choose the Surface Pro. But which one would you choose and why would you choose it? Do you agree with me that it's great that consumers have got lots of choice like this or do you have a special affiliation with one brand or another? Either way, I hope you enjoyed this look at these two great devices. So thanks as always for your comments, your likes, even your dislikes, your shares and your subs. And if you're planning a purchase of either of these devices or indeed anything else, why not support the channel with our Amazon links in the description. And I'll see you next time for some more geekery.